Well, this morning, my message is titled, The Greatest of These. And often in our world, we hear people say, we just need to love everyone. And most of us in here wouldn't disagree with that. We do need to love. Jesus taught us to love. He told us to love. He commanded us to love. You know, the musical artists reflect this. Remember the old Burt Bacharach tune? What the world needs now is what? Is love, sweet love. Or maybe a little bit later on for some of you, we had light of the world, shine on me. Love is the answer. Do you remember that one? That was a little later on for some of you. All you need is love. Love is all you need right? Yes, love is the answer. I'll tell you that. But we as believers, we know that God is love. Love is defined as this. God is love. And so truthfully, the world has been projecting the truth, but not the whole truth. They've been projecting part of the truth. We need love, but they want to find it without God. They don't want God to be in that picture. They want to love without him. But if God is love, there is no love without him. There's no love without him. And so what I'm here to tell you is this. Jesus Christ is one of the Godhead. We know that. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so what I'm here to tell you, what you already, most of you know is this. What the world needs now, what the world needs is Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is God, and because God is love. And so when you hear someone saying, we just need to love everyone, what you should be thinking in your mind as a believer is that everyone needs to know Jesus Christ. Everyone needs to know Jesus Christ, who is the source of love, because God is love. And the world will also talk about faith and hope. They'll talk about it. But without Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ again, it is a false faith and it is a false hope. It is built on things that are shaken. It is built on a foundation that can be shaken. Without Christ, there is no hope. Without him, what do we put our faith in? Do we put our faith in other men? Good luck with that. That's what I would tell you. Good luck. Because even the best of us fail. Do we put our faith in the stock market? Good luck. Good luck. No. Faith and hope can only be found in Jesus Christ. Faith only works when it's placed in someone or something that cannot fail. And Jesus Christ is the only one who cannot fail and will not fail. I want you to open your Bibles if you have them this morning. With me, I would welcome you to open them to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, a verse that many of you are familiar with. And as I was looking through this, I thought to myself, the Bible says the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. But what about faith and hope? Are they not important? Are they not important? What about trust? Because there are times when Jesus says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Right? Lean not on your own understanding. But the greatest is love. And I started to think about this. Well, does that mean that that we have to look at love above these other two, like you can have faith and hope, but it has to be love, it has to be the top. And the Lord said, you know what? You need to pay attention. Don't look at things at face value. Take some time to look at what this is saying and show the people what this is saying. And I want to do that today if I can for you. I want to talk to you about how these things interplay with each other. 
We often think the greater is love, and so the others are lesser. Therefore, they're, they're not as important. But it says the greatest is love. The others are very important. And so there are three areas that I want to talk to you about today, three areas of our life that we need to be aware of. And two of them we tend to be more aware of than the other. But the first one is this. We need to be aware of what God has done. What God has done. The second area is what God is doing. And the third area, you've probably guessed it, is what God is going to do. Now, the one that we are most familiar with is what God has done. The one that we're second most familiar with is what he's going to do. But a lot of times we look past what God is doing. What is he doing right now? What is happening right now in this place? What is happening right now? How is God working? How is God moving? But I want to talk to you about the area of what God has done. And you know, on the grand scale of things, we know this. God has sent his son. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sin. Jesus Christ gave his life. He was beaten and scourged so we could be made whole. He died on a cross. He rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he gave us the Holy Spirit. That's what God has done. And amen for what he's done. I mean, it, we're so blessed in what God has done. What about on a more personal scale? He's given us victory. He has been faithful. He's protected us. He's provided for us. He's blessed us. He's always kept his word. He's walked with us through some of life's most difficult seasons and through some of life's greatest seasons. When we think about what God has done for us, it causes us to be thankful. It causes us to give him praise for what he has done. And when we look back on things that God has done, it builds our trust in him. That's what it does. If you think about someone that you trust, you also will have to bring into consideration that trust where you started with that person is probably not where it is today. I highly doubt that when you entered into a relationship with a person of any kind, that if it's gone on for any period of time, you trusted them as much then as you do now. Why? Because trust takes that journey. It takes that proving of faithfulness. It takes that idea that you know, I, I'm trusting you here. You came through. I'm trusting you again. You've come through. I'm trusting you again. And as you walk through that journey, that person shows you more and more that he or she can be trusted. Sometimes we trust because someone that we trust trusts. Let me explain that. Maybe some of you, your dad had a relationship, business relationship with another person. And you trust your dad. You trust his judgment. And your dad says, hey, this is a person that I trust. And so therefore, what do you do? You trust because your dad trusted. But at the same time, it still takes a time of relationship. It, it still takes a time of proving of that person. Because even as much as your dad can say, you can trust this person until you've walked with that person, until that person has proven himself to you, you're never going to trust them even as much as your dad does, even though you trust your dad. And this is what the Lord does for us. We look back at the things he has done, and we look forward and we say, I can trust him here because he's proven himself. He's been faithful. He's been faithful. He's been faithful. And he's proven, and he's proven, and he's proven, and he's proven. And as you grow more in Christ, as you live longer, as you read 
uh, the Word of God as you continue to, to walk with Him. Your level of trust in Him should grow, should grow. It should never wane. Why? Because He never fails you. He never fails you. He never forsakes you. What He says He will do, He will do. And so a believer's trust should always be growing, but it's built on what God has done. Think of your marriage if you're married. Think of your marriage. The day that you said, I do, were there still areas in which maybe you didn't fully trust your spouse? Now, you don't have to raise your hand on this. You don't have to raise your hand. But here's what I will tell you. It's possible. It's highly likely that through the years, through the faithfulness of your spouse, you have learned more to trust him or her. You've learned more to do that. I can tell you that when I got married, I was awfully young. And, you know, it's hard. It's hard to put all of your trust, even in someone that you love enough that you want to marry them, it's still hard to put all of your trust in that person. It's very difficult. And man, I had a great example of someone to trust, but I'm, it's still difficult. But over the years, as they have proven themselves, as they have given, as they have given reason, as the faithfulness has been there, my trust has grown and grown and grown. And this is what we should see with the Lord. Men, how many times did it take for your wife to be right and you say, honey, you were right before you just started trusting her? I'm just kidding. But it's the same way with God, isn't it? Is it not the same way with God? Do we look back at times and say, God, you were right. You were right. before we finally learn to trust him. You know, it's funny to me. God cannot lie. He cannot fail. But we have to learn to trust him. We have to learn that. You would think that by default, we would see him as being the being that he is. We would see him as being this superior person that will not fail, that cannot fail, and just say, you know what? Why should I not put all my trust in him? But we actually have to learn to trust God. We have to learn to follow God. And when we look back at our life, at all he has done for us, it causes us to trust him more. The next area is what God is doing. So we look back at what God has done and it builds our trust. But when we look at the area of what God is doing, sometimes we're oblivious to this. I'll just say that. Sometimes we are so focused. In today's world, especially, most of the church is focused on what? What God is going to do. We're looking toward the end. And that's not a problem. The Bible says, when these things start to happen, lift up your head. Right? So it's not a problem to be looking forward to what God is going to do. And we know what God is going to do. Amen? But if we're constantly looking forward, we don't ever have a chance to focus on what God is doing in this present time. Because there are things that God has for you and I to do now, in this time, in this day. The things that He said will happen will happen, will happen. But you and I are put on this earth, as the Bible says, for such a time as this, for such a time as this, to be focused on what God is doing. And when you're focused on what God is doing, you're in the flow of what he's doing. He can work in and through you. It's important to know what he's doing. On a large scale, again, what I will tell you is this. God is preparing the church for the last days. He's preparing us for the last days. He is equipping ministers and leaders. He's preparing. He is also sifting the church. He's sifting the church. 
And I want to give you some statistics today. They're pretty staggering, but I want to give them to you so you understand what I mean by the fact that God is sifting the church. 51% of evangelicals who call themselves Christians left the church during the pandemic and never came back. 51%. Now, I don't mean they left and they followed another church online. I don't mean they left and they joined another. I mean they left the faith and never returned. 51%. Now, we know that in the state of Ohio, roughly 25% of churches closed down and never reopened. So those statistics make sense, don't they? They make sense together. So that tells us what? I've never been a big math person, but I can tell you that means 49% remain. And we say, well, amen, we're part of the 49%, right? Well, let me tell you something else. This is even more striking to me because the Bible says in the last days there'll be a great falling away. That's pretty great falling away, over half. You're seeing things. Remember, what is God doing? What's happening now? We're looking, oh, there's going to be a great falling away. 51%. That's over half. If it doesn't sound like a big number, think about your bank account right now. 51% of it all of a sudden disappeared. How would you feel about that? <laughs> but let me tell you something that's even more difficult for me. Four out of every ten evangelical pastors were surveyed. There was a survey done, I'll tell you. Four out of every ten, 40 percent, do not any longer believe that the Word of God is relevant today or that it is the standard by which they should base and preach and, and base their faith, the foundation. Four out of every ten surveyed said the word of God no longer is relevant. Now that's more staggering to me than the 51% leaving. When you have pastors, people who are standing on the platform that do not believe the word of God. My question is, what are they preaching? What are you preaching if you do not believe that the Word of God is relevant? What are you preaching? I can tell you right now, I will tell you right now, this Word is relevant. It's more relevant than my Word will ever be. This Word is true. This Word is the standard. This Word is the foundation. Whatever I say from this pulpit, you judge it according to this Word. Do you understand what I'm saying? I want you to do that. I want you to be a steward of the word. When I say something, I want you to look in your Bible and I want you to say, is he saying what is lining up with the word of God? Is it lining up? That's what I want you to do. God is preparing his people. He's preparing his people. We can spend all day talking about the relevance of this word. All day. I can, any, anything that you want to bring if you stood up right now in this church and you said, this is the scenario, this is the case, this is my question, there's something in this word that will answer it. Now, here's what I think. I think the idea that they have that it's not relevant is irrelevant. What I think is, what they're saying is, I can't find anything in here that's going to please my congregation. I can't find anything in this word anymore that's going to allow me to, to not lose 5,000 of my followers on Facebook because I preach it. I can't find anything in this word anymore that, that will allow me to not offend half of the church. Well, guess what? 51% of the church left. I don't know who's left to offend. But I can tell you, the 49% that are left... Most of them, I'm praying, believe that this is the word of God, that we stand on it, that it is our foundation. If you don't, this is the word of God. This is what we stand on. It is our foundation. You need to believe that. 
But God is preparing His people. He's preparing to pour out His Spirit, as it says in the book of Joel. He's preparing for a great harvest of souls, and we are going to be a part of it. We are going to be a part of it. Here at Beloved Ministries, we are going to be a part of it. You and I are going to be a part of it. Now, if you don't want to be a part of it, I guess you might want to go somewhere because we're going to be a part of it, okay? That's what we're going to do because we're in line with the Word of God. He's equipping us. He's preparing us. He's pouring out His Spirit upon us, and we are going to be a part of that. But we have to be in tune with what God is doing, what He is doing. He's equipping right now. He's preparing. He's sifting. He's training and when we are aware of what God is doing, it builds our faith. It builds our faith. As you look back through the scripture, as you look through the stories, faith always came alongside an action. Peter, when he stepped out of the boat, that was faith. It was something present that was happening. It was happening right then. Jesus said, come. Lord, if you bid me, I'll come. Come. And faith stepped out of the boat. Faith reached and touched the garment of Jesus Christ in that moment. And what did Jesus say? Great is your faith. Faith is now. It's something that is present. It's something that is active. We have faith not once we see the outcome. See, a lot of times we want to have faith once we see the outcome. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. What we did a few minutes ago, we prayed for that little girl. We exercised faith now. Now. That's the faith. Not, well, when we see what happens, then we'll say we had faith. No, no, no. We had faith, and we will see what happens. Amen? That's faith. Faith happens now. It's present. It's based on what God is doing. Lord, I have faith you're healing me. When? Now. Lord, I have faith you're providing for me. Now. Lord, I have faith you're protecting me. Now. So what God has done for us, it builds our trust. It builds our trust. What God is doing builds our faith. And finally, we come to the third area, what God is going to do. Future tense, right? What he is going to do. Now, on a large scale, keeping up with the other two, God is going to pour out his spirit in a way that we've never seen before. And I really believe that. If you're familiar with the Azusa Street Revival, and the revival of the gifts of the Spirit and all of the things that happened, and it was a great outpouring of the Spirit of God, I think this will dwarf that, what God is going to do, what He's going to do. A great outpouring. He's going to rapture the church. He's going to come back for us. The church is going to be raptured. We are going to be caught up, as the Bible says. Those who are alive and remain. It says those who are dead will rapture first out of the graves, and then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up with him in the air. The rapture of the church. A lot of people might say, well, I don't believe in the rapture. I like to say, well, we'll talk about it on the way up. We'll talk about it. But you know what? Jesus is coming back for his church. He's going to establish his kingdom. He's going to rule for a thousand years. He's going to destroy the Antichrist. Destroy. Man, I'll tell you what. We, we are not, I, I know a lot of people want to say this person is the Antichrist and that person I, I believe we are truly experiencing the spirit of Antichrist. Antichrist. The spirit is there. But the person, the person that embodies that, the Bible says that he cannot show himself until the church is gone. I'll tell you one thing. You and I 
the church of Jesus Christ, the believers, the salt and the light, we are holding back the tide, everybody. We're holding back the tide. I want you to understand that. We are holding back the tide. If you think that the world is getting dark, wait until the church is gone. Because at that point, there's nothing to hold back the tide. But the church is the salt, and the church is the light. He's going to cast the devil and all of his demons into the lake of fire. We should be excited about that. We should be excited about that. He's going to call forth a new heaven and a new earth. And he's going to reign and rule forever and ever and ever. Amen. And we shall reign with him forever and ever and ever. Amen. That's what God is going to do. Where do I find that? Right here in this book. You four out of ten pastors, right here in this book is where I found that. Thank God for the 60% of pastors, right? I'm, I'm ta I, that bothers me, everybody. That bothers me. It bothers me more for the people sitting under those pastors. It bothers me for them. It worries me for them. And you know what? Like I said before, I think a lot of the church that is remaining, a lot of the believers that are remaining, they're going to start seeing through that, so we better get some more seats ready because they're going to want to go where they're hearing the truth. And may it always be said at Beloved Ministries, we preach the truth. Amen? But on a smaller scale of what God is going to do, he's going to reveal himself more to his people. He's going to reveal himself more. He's going to continue to equip them to evangelize in these last days. Listen, if you think evangelism has been tough over the years, it's, this is one of the toughest times you're going to have to evangelize. I mean, if you think about part of this, our, our region that we're in for a long time and probably still to, today is referred to the Bible Belt, right? Okay? But I'm telling you, that's starting to dissipate. That's starting to go away. There's, they, they call it the Bible Belt, but you're not seeing it like you would. You would think you would see it. It's going to get hard to evangelize. It's going to get tough. It's going to get difficult. But God is equipping you. He's equipping me to do so. Amen? And he's providing ways for us to do it. He's giving, he's, he's showing us his power. Listen, don't worry, and I'm not saying this in, in a disrespectful way at all, and I'm not telling you to do something that is against the law, but I'm telling you, don't worry about the things that are being handed down from the Supreme Court, that are being handed down from the executive branch, that are being handed down from the legislative branch, because look what God did. He said, you know what, this is what the Supreme Court wanted to hand down, and this is what I told them to hand down. This is what the, the school in Washington wanted to do to this football coach, and this is what I caused to happen, that now that football coach can go out there and pray in that field in front of all those people and be an example. And I'm telling you something, that ruling opened more doors than just him kneeling down on the football field and praying. Praise God for that. Listen, he's equipping. He's setting the stage. He's preparing he will open the door. you just got to be willing to walk through the door he's asking you to walk through. He's going to continue to provide for his church. He's going to continue to draw sinners to the cross. That's what he's going to do. Listen, the Bible says he is not willing that any should perish. That any should perish. Why is the Lord tarrying? Why are we still here? Why are, why, why are we waiting for the rapture to happen still? Because nothing that needs to be fulfilled has to be fulfilled for the rapture to happen. It's, it's all been fulfilled. So why are we waiting? Because he's not willing that any should perish. He wants to give as much time for every person to come to the knowledge of Christ. And he's equipping you and he's equipping me to do that. He's going to continue saving. 
He's going to continue healing. And I want you to be aware of this. We've seen it. We've seen it in our own people, in our own church, the the power of the healing of God. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that in the last days, there will be plagues, plural. I know. You don't want to hear that. We just went through one, swept the world, right? Plagues, pestilences. But guess what? Here's what I know. Here's what I'm believing, that in the church, there's going to be healing. Something's going to draw people to the church. What's it going to be? What's it going to be? We don't know what this plague is. We don't know how to treat it. There's not any treatment for it yet. But guess what? This person went to the church and they got healed. And this person went to the church and they got healed. And these people attend church and it's not affecting them. It's not bothering them. And somebody should be saying amen to that. The Lord is going to draw people to his church, to his church. He's going to continue to set the captives free. He's going to continue to break the chains of addiction. He's going to continue to restore marriages and marriage and marriage and marriage. He's going to continue to build relationships. He's going to continue to lead and guide and direct his people. You see, what God is going to do develops our hope. What God has done develops our trust. What he is doing develops our faith. What God is going to do develops our hope. You know, there is no hope without Jesus Christ. I can tell you that I had a principle, the only principle I had for the first 10 years of my career. We had a very honest conversation one time, off the record, and he said, you know, he said, our kids just don't have any hope. And I smiled at him a little bit, not in a snarky way, but over sitting on my desk, I looked over and there was my Bible sitting there on my desk. And there were a lot of things I wanted to say in that moment, but I knew, I knew that there is hope. There is hope. It was was 10 feet away from them, 10 feet away. But I'm telling you, the only hope that we have is in Jesus Christ. And let me tell you this, hope for the believer is not wishing something is going to happen. It's not. The world looks at it that way. Well, I hope that this happens. And it's like a wish. It's like, it's like you know, uh, uh, some type of, it's like a Disney movie, right? You're wishing. You're wishing on what? A star? No. We hope in Jesus Christ. We hope in Jesus Christ. And it's not a wishing that will happen. What it is is this. In the Greek, it says El peace. The word means it's a confident expectation of good. A confident expectation of good. When we have hope in Jesus Christ, we have confidence in what God is going to do. And that is what we call hope. The Bible says faith is the evidence of things hoped for. I have a confident expectation that Jesus Christ is going to return for his church. I have a confident expectation that my sins are forgiven. I have a confident expectation that I will live eternally with Jesus Christ. And so because of that, the evidence of that is faith. What is happening right now in this time is that I am preaching the gospel to you so that you can have a confident expectation of what is going to happen in your life. There is no worrying. There is no wondering. Hope is not wishing. I wish. I, you don't look at, at Jesus Christ and say, well, I hope I'm okay to make it into heaven. I hope what he said is true. I hope that I get to spend eternity. No, you know it. You have a confident expectation of what? Good things to come. Good things to come. You have hope. 
When the unseen becomes seen, we have faith. We have faith. Faith is the evidence of things unseen. Remember, faith is present. It's present. When things happen right before our eyes, it builds our faith. It builds our faith. It builds our faith. And how, how, how do these things happen? How does the Lord build our faith? By demonstration, by signs, and by wonders. By things that happen in the midst of the people that are around. Many times it, it talks about how the people, when Jesus healed someone, they marveled at what happened. It built their faith. The, the friends lowered their friend into the midst of that group of people, and Jesus healed him there. Why? To build their faith. It's something that was happening now. Faith is present. When a person is healed in our midst, does it not cause our faith to grow? When you see miraculous things happen, does it not cause your faith to grow? When that financial blessing comes into your hand in the exact moment that you need it, and there's no way that anyone could have known except Jesus Christ that you needed it, and it comes into your hand in that now moment, and your faith is built. And the next time that you're lacking, you have trust because of what happened in the now moment before. So when someone is healed in our presence, it builds our faith. When we hear about someone being he healed, it builds our hope. It builds our hope, a confident expectation of good. What God has done for them, he will do for me. Think of it this way. When God moves a mountain, we trust him after it's moved. When he's moving the mountain... We have faith. Remember, Jesus said this, speak to the mountain and it be uprooted. And when we see a mountain that needs moving, we have hope. We have hope that the God of our trust and the God of our faith is going to move the mountain. But back to the verse, hope and love and faith but the greatest is love, right? That's what it says. And I've spent a lot of time talking to you about how awesome it is to have faith and how awesome it is to have hope. But God says the greatest is love. Let me tell you, love encompasses all three of these. It encompasses all three. When we look back at what God has done for us, what do we see? We see his love. When we look at what God is doing right now, what do we see? We see his love. When we look forward, when we hope for what we know he will do, what do we see? We see his love. His love is the thread that runs through all of those areas, the things that he's done, the things that he's doing, the things that he will do. Love runs through all. It was his love for us that caused him to do the things which caused us to trust him. It was his love for us that causes him to do for us the things that build our faith. And it will be his love for us in which all he is going to do will cause us to have hope. You see, the greatest is love because God is love. God is love. That's why it's the greatest when we focus on Jesus Christ, when we focus on what he has done, when we focus on what he is doing, and when we focus on what he is going to do, we will experience the all-encompassing love of Jesus Christ, the greatest of these. 